Hello again, YouTube. Uh, we're continuing our discuss discussion about slavery in the Bible, uh, specifically slavery in the New Testament, and we're now going to turn our attention to the book of Philemon. Um, I'm not going to read the entire book or the entire letter. You can do that on your own. I'm going to read, though, the ten verses that are often come, or often come into question when dealing with uh, slavery in the Bible. Um, Philemon, verse eight, 8 through 18. Beginning in verse 8, it says, Therefore, though I might be bold in Christ to command you, what is fitting, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you, being such as one as Paul the aged, and also the prisoner of Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ. Verse 10, I appeal to you, O my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while you were while in my chains, who was once who was once unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. I am sending him back. You therefore receive him that is that is my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains uh, for the gospel. But without your consent I wanted to do nothing, that, that your good deed might be not be by compulsion, but as it were, but voluntary. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever. No longer as a slave, but, at, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Yet then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would receive me. But if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. Uh, to begin with, uh, the discussion of slavery in the New Testament is very different than the discussion that takes place in the Old Testament, or uh, slavery as sanctioned by Mosaic Law. And, and again, I've already spent quite a bit of time on that. Um, put, to put it uh, uh, simply, you know, the slavery that's taking place here in the New Testament, as opposed to what was going on in the Old Testament, is, is just different. It was different. It was different from what was practiced by other nations in the ancient Near East. And slaves did have some rights in the, under the Roman system. We might refer to this as serfdom or indentured servanthood. Basically, the early church isn't making the rules. It's dealing with the reality of life within the Roman Empire. Why Paul and the apostles chose to deal with the institution the way they did. It seems that Paul deals with slavery the same way Martin Luther King Jr. dealt with civil rights in the 1960s. He is undermining the institution. Paul is trying to change society through love, which is more important than advocating a change in the law. When you take, on, take a serious look at Philemon, it should be apparent that Paul brings the institution into an atmosphere that it would only wilt and die. Before I jump too deep into Philemon, I would like to point out a few New Testament passages that you should consider. Again. Paul's injunction to free people do not become slaves of men, 1 Corinthians 7.23, which would certainly preclude becoming slaves for, reach, uh, for any types of reasons of uh, ambition. It should be pointed out that there were references in history that some early Christians in the, first century church, in the first century church sold themselves into slavery to buy food for the poor. Christians have and still do use social, economic, and political systems of men to help the poor and spread the faith. Second point. Paul condemned slave trading, uh, a common practice, in, a common practice in, in the New World or slavery as we know it. And I've already quoted uh, 1 Timothy chapter uh, 1 verses 9 through 10. Uh, he outright uh, uh, condemned slave trades, uh, slave traders. And Paul, in point three, Paul tells slaves to become free if they can. 1 uh, Corinthians 7:21. Now, as we look at Philemon, we need to reread verse 16 and then read verse 21. These two verses together seem to indicate to most commentaries that, that, and Bible historians that Paul is writing to Philemon to accept his runaway slave Onesimus back as a free man. Paul's letter makes it very clear that he wishes Philemon to free Onesimus upon his return. And that is something ethnically oblig uh, obligating, um, obligatory, ought to do, verses 8 through 9, um, excuse me, verses 8 through 11. Perhaps the reason he was, he, had, he was separated for, from you for a while was that he might, that, let me restate this again, uh, looking at verses 8 through 11, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a while was that you might um, have him back for good. I'm sorry, that's verse 15. Verse 16, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but never dearer to you, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in, in the Lord. Verse 17, so if you consider me a partner, welcome him back as you would welcome me. Clearly, Paul could have ordered in the authority of Christ for Philemon to be set free. 
Instead, he's giving Onesimus the choice to do the right thing in Christ and set Philemon free. Why? A loving appeal is often better than an authoritative command, and Paul gives Philemon his free will choice to do the right thing in Christ. In this case, Paul communicates the correct action from the heart without appealing to uh, authority. This is what we might expect given the anti-legalism and pro-spirit teaching of Paul. This is also a theme in Paul that says the only voluntary acts of goodness are rewarded or praiseworthy. And this would uh, certainly provide a motive for him to give Philemon the chance to act voluntarily. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 6. What amazes me is that abolitionist writers use this passage of scripture to argue against pre-Civil War slavery. And ironically, the skeptics' view of the passage would have been aligned with the pre-Civil War slave owners. Now, I have answered Philemon, but I wanted to point out some of these point out some of the circumstances Paul was dealing with when he wrote Philemon. Number one, it was a major crime, major crime to harbor a runaway. Soon thereafter, it became a capital crime. At the same time, uh, the the privilege of asylum was conferred onto the temple. A suit for compensation and penalty was instituted against uh, private individuals who should either help or harbor runaway slaves. Flight of slaves was an issue to be regulated. The prosecution of persons either by persuading a slave to run away, concealing his whereabouts, or seizing or selling or purchasing him, uh, purchasing him was unknown to Roman law from the second century BC. It became a crime, a capital crime, no longer punished uh, necessarily by a monetary penalty, but, but also by banishment to the mines or crucifixion. This is according to uh, New Documents Illustrating Early Christianity, 1997. Paul could not afford for the early church to be stigmatized in this way. Paul's decision to turn on Isthmus, uh, return on Isthmus was an attempt to protect Christianity from the charge of kidnapping. Number three, he had to act quickly because there might have been huge incentives other other than legal for those around him to turn him in. His let Paul's letter makes it fairly clear that he wishes Philemon to free Onesimus upon his return, and that is something ethnically obligatory ought to do. Uh, verses 15 through 17, uh, 17. Paul makes it clear that he had the authority to command Philemon to do so, verse 8. Yet Paul still seeks for Philemon's actions to be conscience-driven and from a Christian ethnic uh, ethic of love, verses 9 and verse 21. There's very little uh, ambiguity here, but Paul is clearly coaxing Philemon to make the right choice, which Paul makes clear. When he falls short of, at least in this epistle, is, is some authoritative command, even though he could have, as verse 8 makes clear to Philemon, which would over override Philemon's free will choice in the matter. Whether he's trying to let Philemon get the credit for the action, since it would have represented Philemon's investment, or whether he's, re he's deferring to Philemon because he would have a better knowledge of the problematic circumstances of any problematic circumstances unclear from the text. Remember at the time of, writing, of the writing, Paul had only heard Onesimus' side of the story and knew what it might ha have involved some type of injury to Philemon. What is clear is that Paul wanted Philemon to take action in keeping with the general uh, new creation ethic. Given the potential abuses in the system, as I've already stated, we would not expect enthusiastic endorsement of slavery. We certainly don't have any endorsements of slavery as a human social system in Paul, but rather the numerous anti-slavery monsters as noted above or noted, noted already. It seems that, um, it seems ambig ambigu ambigu yeah, ambiguous in character at the juncture in history uh, precludes a wholesale uh, freedom motif, but the goal of freedom for all is very clear throughout Paul's writings. Uh, in the next video, we're going to turn our attention to what extent is the New Testament considered condoning slavery, which is often voiced as a typical objection.